Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, call us to order here. Uh, my name is Jerry White. I'm the chair of the uh, Research Scholarly and Artistic Work Committee for the English Department this year. And on behalf of the committee and uh, the whole department, it's my pleasure to welcome everybody here for this sort of signature lecture um, of the year, the Millard Lecture. It's going to be given by uh, Professor Lisa Vargo. So before we get underway, I'm going to call on a student from our one of our first year classes. Uh, he's in the uh, Elijah Cross, who's going to uh, pronounce our language. I'll accept Mr. Cross. Yes, sir. First, I'll recite it in uh, my language, which is the plain free language, and then I'll say it once more in English. So, without wasting any time. Thanks to wait to know of that, a high I up, the classic that I'm not a winner, a sweet I see. They asked Mama Way of when they gave Mama Wink to get up, a kid that was out check, a real work, a wing of work, that the pair is set of the PM so work, which is one of work, a glass deep was up. Next to wait to now, Yaki out, a year of work, or the PM so work, a glass deep, a glass deep work, or the cat for your check, or a skier, a teen away. We acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and travel news to the Treaty, Soto, Blackfoot, Maine, Bay, and Dakota Sioux. We acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. And that's it. Aye, aye. Okay. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, without further ado, then, I'll proceed to uh, the introduction. So, uh, no stranger to this crowd, I think, but I'll say a few words about Lisa Vargo who came to the Department of English uh, in 1990. Uh, and she is now Distinguished Professor of English uh, here at the University of Saskatchewan, as well as being Acting Head of the Department of Art and Art History. Uh, so she has taught twice in, uh, at uh, IITGN in Gujarat, and also at Yalogian Yelogi University in Krakow. Uh, she was awarded the Keith Shelley Association of America's Distinguished Scholar Award in 2018, and is a past winner of national and provincial awards for volunteer work in community-based literacy as well as a University of Saskatchewan Award for Outreach and a Students' Union uh, Teaching Award. So she's uh, the editor of numerous works, uh, including uh, Lodore and Nightmare Abbey, both from Broadview Press, as well as Mary Shelley's uh, Spanish and Portuguese Lives, which she edited for Mary Shelley's Literary Lives and Other Writings, whose general editor is Nora Crook and published by uh, Pickering and Shadow. Volume 2 uh, of the collected works of Anna Leticia Barbeau, uh, further, uh, further today's talk, co-edited with, with Paula Feldman, is due to appear from Oxford University Press later this year. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Lisa. Uh, we'll have the lecture, and then we'll have a question period afterwards. So folks, please stick around for that. Okay, Lisa Vargo. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you, Elijah. Yeah, and um, it is a pleasure to be uh, speaking to you on Treaty 6 territory. Uh, and we pay our respects to the ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. I'd like to uh, thank you for coming today and thank the Department of English for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, and uh, I, the talk will take somewhere between 40 and 45 minutes, depending on how much I ad lib and how much I stutter uh, from nervousness. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, just, and, and I'll give you the talk section by section, and I'll say conclusion, and then you can all be relieved that we're almost there. Um, so, uh, an overview, uh, as is suggested here with a couple of images, a couple of my favorite images of Peter Millard. This talk acknowledges Peter Millard's advocacy for human rights by considering the career of Anna Letitia Barbo. Her place within the intellectual culture of late 18th century Protestant descent, a group who were denied civil liberties, represents an example of a writer, a social activist. I'll offer some brief reflections about my experience with getting to know her work and the transformation of her literary reputation as a prelude to a discussion of some of her lesser known writings, which illuminate the particular character of her career as a public intellectual and advocate for rights. Her writings em employ wit, as well as they exhibit her anger about instances of social injustice. So, section one, a brief introduction. Pardon me if I begin in a nostalgic mode. 
In offering this talk, I wish to thank the members of the department who offered me a position in the Department of English, as Jerry said, uh, way back in 1990. There's a couple of you here who were there then. Uh, the head of the, at the time was Peter Millard. Uh, and he and the faculty took a chance on me and opened many doors for me and have given me my life and career at this university. Sorry, uh, I didn't expect that. Um, focus on the wit here. Uh, I, I include a card with a photograph of a door that Peter sent me uh, once he had retired. Uh, and um, he claims he had written it uh, after having a gin and tonic on an empty stomach. Uh, and you can read what he says about me, uh, which uh, I think uh, uh, is... Uh, says more about maybe him and captures uh, a characteristic, characteristic example of Peter's voice uh, than perhaps uh, describes me. But uh, I love to think that I live a life for pleasure. Uh, I was blessed uh, with a fellow romanticist colleague, Anthony Harding, with whom I continue to share a connection. I apologize to the many people, uh, many of you are here today, uh, who I could thank. Uh, uh, at the U of S and within my scholarly community. But primarily I wish to thank the Barbold scholars with whom I've been working for the past few years on a collected uh, works of Anna Barbold for Oxford University Press. And that's William McCarthy, Scott Krashuk, Elizabeth Kraft, and Paula Feldman, as well as my Barbold website co-editor, uh, Professor Allison Murray from this university. Uh, as Mary Shelley observed in her 1831 preface to Frankenstein, everything must have a beginning, and that beginning must be linked to something that went before. The Hindus give the world an elephant to support it, but they make the elephant stand upon a tortoise. So in thinking about my beginnings, my tortoise is a 1995 session at the MLA called The Canonizing of Anna Letitia Barbel, which is where I met Bill McCarthy and Elizabeth Kraft. And during that session, uh, the uh, romanticist critic Anne Malore insisted that we hold a vote on how to pronounce Barbel's name. Uh, she was, even then, just still so little known. My Elephant is a lecture that was given in April 2009 on Mary Wollstonecraft and Newington Green radicalism, plus birthday cake, uh, at Newington Green a Unitarian Church. The talk was delivered by Barbara Taylor, who's a graduate of the U of S, a noted Wollstonecraft scholar, and uh, I'm happy to call a friend. I want to focus on the elephant. Uh, as I found a place to, uh, in the church to sit for the lecture, I chose a place quite at random and soon discovered a well-polished plaque commemorating where Barbold sat when she attended the church in the early 19th century. What an unexpected thrill to go to a lecture on Mary Wollstonecraft and find Anna Barbold. The church was packed with people eager to hear about Wollstonecraft. And when a woman came to sit next to me, I explained that I would have moved over, but I was quite excited about sitting where Anna Barbold sat. And her reply was, who is Mrs. Barbold? Section two. Barbold was born Anna Aiken. She was a poet, essayist, anthologist, and teacher who lived between 1743 and 1825, and she was part of the nonconformist intellectual circle associated with the Warrington Academy, which was a place where nonconformist uh, men went to university to be trained uh, as ministers and, and, and in, for other professions, and her father taught there along with Joseph Priestley. As a rational dissenter, she belonged to a group who did not offer allegiance to the test acts of course, uh, for the Anglican Church, and rejected a connection between church and state. Dissenters were denied rights extended to Anglicans, such as holding public office and attending Oxford and Cambridge. 
And more importantly, in the 1790s, uh, their pro-French, anti-war, and pro-Republican sympathies made them subjected to attack. Barbo published a celebrated volume of poems at the end of 1772. She co-authored works with her brother, uh, most notably uh, uh, some writings called Evenings at Home, which were collected in a number of volumes. After her marriage, she ran a school for boys between 1774 and 1785 at Palgrave, Suffolk. And her husband, Rauchemont, uh, 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 with her husband, Rauchemont, sorry, and they adopted a son, uh, one of her brother's uh, sons, or they adopted a, uh, who was, uh, for whom Barbold wrote Lessons for Children. The Barbolds moved to Hampstead in 1787, where Rochemont was a Unitarian minister, and she met with a circle of figures associated with her publisher, uh, Joseph Johnson, who published, hosted, and supported figures like William Blake, Mary Wollstonecraft, Henry Fuseli, and William Godwin. He was famed for dinner parties, and just imagine what those events would have been like, as well as scientists and nonconforming theologians at the time. During the 1790s, she wrote prose pamphlets advocating the repeal of the Test Acts, the abolition of slavery, and Britain's involvement in war with France. The Barbolds moved to Stoke Newington in 1802, and in 1808, after attacking his wife, Rochemont, who suffered from a mental illness, drowned himself. Barbold continued writing and editing, including a multi-volumed uh, uh, work of British novelists, a volume of extracts for women called The Female Speaker, and her poem 1811, which appeared in 1812, uh, to much criticism. She attended the meeting house at Newington Green and ran a book club uh, for uh, women until her death in 1825. And I hope you've been focused on this slide uh, featuring some of the comments that were made about Barbel during her lifetime uh, by uh, Coleridge primarily. Uh, I published an essay that had the phrase Mistress Bear and Bold in it. And you can get into trouble uh, entering that into the internet. Uh, anyway, uh, Barbel was certainly subject to criticism within her time. Uh, all I knew about her for many years as a uh, teaching and researching uh, the Romantic period was she was the subject of a footnote pointing out that she didn't understand Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, and that quotation is there on the left. She was both viewed as an idealized muse. Uh, here she appears uh, in a painting of the period uh, as one of the nine living muses, and uh, she's the woman uh, on the left with her hand out. Uh, doesn't look anything, I don't think any of these <laughs> women actually look like the way they're depicted, but they're noted uh, women writers, artists, and musicians uh, of the period. Uh, she was also uh, uh, viewed as a, a radical scourger of Edmund Burke. Uh, this is about as kinky and interesting as it's going to get during this lecture. Uh, there she is in a blue dress whipping Edmund Burke, uh, who is dressed uh, as, as a clown. Uh, and um, she's uh, saying, I think, to uh, uh, Richard Price, uh, who is a, a preacher at Newington Green, and of course wrote uh, in favor of the French Revolution and made Burke write his uh, 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 treatise in favor against the French Revolution. Uh, she is uh, looking forward uh, to uh, whipping him. Anyway, uh, so uh, uh, while she was, as you can see, attacked in her own time for being too radical, uh, she was also attacked, as we've already seen, by people like Lamb for uh, lacking imagination in her children's writing and banishing all the old classics of the nursery. Her recovery in the late 20th century has led to disappointments of another sort. One can look to the example of her short poem, The Rights of Woman, which was not published during her lifetime, and we have no idea whether she ever wanted it published, uh, and a poem she did publish, 1811, uh, which was, 
and the different responses they evoke for us uh, they're kind of opposite to ones they might have been during the time. Uh, the one work uh, which asks women to abandon each ambitious thought seems to devalue rights and is interpreted as an attack on Mary Wollstonecraft, while the other demonstrates her social activism with its vision of Britain's guilt and decline as her glories pass away. Barbold might be viewed as a victim of her family as well. Uh, again, you can see the kind of response uh, the work uh, attracted uh, from uh, the quarterly review. We had hoped that the empire might have been saved without the intervention of a lady author. Uh, this uh, criticism was uh, said to, though I don't believe it, uh, have discouraged Barbold so much that she stopped publishing poetry. And this is a story that's perpetuated, for instance, by her niece in her memoir uh, of Barbold, uh, where she uh, establishes the posthumous uh, reputation of Barbold as a proper lady who's treated with scorn by the unmanly, the malignant, and the base uh, who ended her career as a poet. So, section three, examples of her writings with about rights, lessons for children, and essays from the monthly magazine. I'm suggesting, as is the case, with many writers who have not had a continued and evolving sense of how they were read, it's difficult to read works that have rejoined the canon when there has been a rupture between how the, their contemporaries read their work and how we might do so. As well, only a selection of Barbold's writings, mostly her poetry, and if you know any of her writings, it's probably her poetry, a few of her poems, is known to 20th, first century readers. With respect to recovering Barbold's intervention in contemporary debates about rights, there are obvious places to look. And it is clear that her own exclusion as a dissenter made her sensitive about the rights of others. If you know one of her best known works, her poem, The Mouse's Petition, and its plea, let not thy strong oppression force a freeborn mouse detain. Uh, you know that she reads the mouse uh, in terms of slavery and rights for prisoners. Uh, she knew John Howard quite well, in fact, uh, there's a suggestion that she wanted to marry him. Uh, and she champions natural and civil rights in the poem Through the Mouse, in which nature's commoners should enjoy the common gifts of heaven. Her essays and address uh, to, to the oppressors of the repeal of the Corporation of the Test Act, sins of government, sins of the nation, and thoughts on the inequality of conditions are striking works, as well as her poem's epistle to William Wilberforce on the rejection of the bill for abolishing the slave trade, and, uh, which was a work greatly admired by Francis Burney uh, and Corsica. But I'm not going to talk about any of these. For the remainder of this talk, I'll consider some lesser known examples, which I've thought about while editing uh, Barbold's writings for the collected Barbold. And those are uh, her writings, Lessons for Children, and two essays written for the monthly magazine, edited by her brother, John Aiken, who is a medical doctor and writer. These writings employ less obvious genres for advocating for rights, literature for young children and the witty popular essay. While they're lighter in tone and seemingly uh, in import, they should be connected with her more serious writings with respect to their advocacy and promotion of an act of citizenry and a sense of inclusion basic to civil liberties. Rather than having a child's empty noddle turned with the conceit of his own powers, as Charles Lamb suggests, the deceptively simple lessons for children are a child's primer of natural rights and were immensely popular well into the 19th century, though much revised at the hands of others. They consist of four volumes written for her adopted nephew, Charles, 
and were published between 1778 and 1779 and for ch intended for children between the ages of two and four and Barbold uh, herself learned to read at the age of three. The lessons expand the notion of rights in two respects, I want to argue. They're meant to educate children uh, from the earliest age about their responsibilities and connections as citizens of the world. And they offer a notion of rights, which includes the natural world. They represent a revolutionary example of uh, literature for children, given her insistence on being um, uh, uh, produced in a small size. Uh, so this is a very tiny book that a child uh, could uh, hold in their hands. Uh, and a, a lot good paper uh, and a large typeface that present a conversational exchange between a mother and child. William McCarthy offers a helpful perspective on the text in his essay, How Dissent Made Anna Barbold. As a theorized dissenter, her purpose, McCarthy says, is to form a new kind of citizen who balances individual agency with relationship and interdependence. In so doing, McCarthy argues, she drew her vocabulary for lessons from sights and sounds, flora and fauna of the country, village, where she wrote, where she wrote it, and the daily life of the child for whom she wrote it, to employ teaching principles of intellectual inquiry and citizenly ethics typical of dissent. I would add to what McCarthy says that Barbold's vision of an ethical life in the lessons includes an extension of rights to the natural world. A simple lesson in how charles and pasture animals gain nourishment emphasizes a sense of a shared landscape. Bread is to eat. You must not throw it away. Corn makes bread. Corn grows in the fields. Grass grows in the fields. Cows eat grass and sheep eat grass and horses eat grass. Little boys do not eat grass. No, they eat bread and milk. I hope you've learned something now. <laughs> Elsewhere in the lessons, Barbold explains that meat is not for boys. A diet of milk, honey, and bread is a pastoral one that suggests mutuality with the other animals. While animals and boy require fields in which to grow their food, the cow eating grass is necessary for the production of the little boy's milk. The parallel grammar of the sentences and repetition of grows in fields and eat and do not eat reinforce connections rather than impose hierarchy. But when hierarchy exists, it involves the responsibility of ensuring mutual rights. While Puss can climb a tree much better than Charles, unlike Puss, Charles can speak and learn to read and should not rub Puss's fur the wrong way or pull her tail. Puss kills birds, and that is her instinct if it is regrettable because Puss should, Puss should concentrate on just killing mice. Uh, and Barbold condemns uh, boys, though, who kill birds and rob nests for sport. She observes in her essay, Thoughts on the Inequality of Conditions, it is the intent of nature that all her children should live. Yet she has not made specific provision for them all. The larger cattle graze the meadows and strong animals subdue their prey. But she has likewise formed a countless number of smaller tribes who have no pasture, but the fields of others labor. This is a challenge she offers, and in her essay on inequality, her answer is a leveling principle of philanthropy that would smooth, while reminding those who have provisions to provide for others. The lessons begin at a more basic level of uh, recognizing what should rightfully be shared with others. He, uh, Charles is taught to share with other humans, 
as well as understanding his place in nature. A long list of animal noises includes the human boy, the peacock screams, the beetle hums, the duck quacks, the goose cackles, monkeys chatter, the owl hoots, the screech owl shrieks, the snake hisses, Charles talks. Charles, who talks, unlike the dog and kitten, has responsibilities for the rights he has been given. As Bubbled makes clear in a passage that may seem quite shocking to us, and it was eliminated uh, by other editors in later editions, uh, and in these later editions, individuals would often uh, offer their uh, own editions. I can tell a little story about that if anyone is interested. I never saw a little dog or cat learn to read, but little boys can learn. If you do not learn, Charles, you are uh, uh, half as good uh, as much as puss. You would better be drowned. Uh, <laughs> take that as a lesson, everybody. <laughs> Close observation of likenesses pr promotes forms of sociability between humans and nature. Barbo locates, as I'm trying to show, a series of commonalities uh, and uh, uh, in, some, in another instance of clothing and shelter. The sheep's wool is its petticoat, while the horse's hair and the bird's feathers are called petticoats, which like Charles's frock and petticoats offer warmth. Charles learns that home takes many forms. Birds build nests in trees, that is their house. The wolf has a den, that is his house. The dog has a kennel. The bees live in a hive, the pigs live in a sty. The particulars offer a sense of plenitude and connection through correspondence. Each creature has its particular house in which it dwells in the landscape. In this sense, house, petticoats, or carpet establish equalities in the mind of the child. Here is a seat of turf and a bank almost covered with violets. We shall sit here and you and Billy may lie on the carpet. The carpet is in the parlor. Yes, there is a carpet in the parlor, but there's a carpet here too. What is it? The grass is a carpet out of doors. Pretty green soft carpet and it is very large for it spreads everywhere all over the fields and all over the meadows, and it is very pleasant for the sheep and the lambs to lie upon. I do not know what they would do without it, for they have no feather bed to sleep upon. The suggestion of fellow feeling for the comforts of a carpet points to lessons of moral sensibility intended to unite human and natural realm. The familiar essay in the form of a letter to the editor is another genre in which Barbold enters into the public world to encourage the extension of rights by way of political reform. Barbold contributed around 20 essays to the monthly magazine uh, for which, as I've said, her brother served as editor between 1796 and 1806. The bookseller Richard, Richard Phillips who uh, served a prison sentence for selling Thomas Paine's Rights of Man, founded the monthly magazine in 1796. Uh, and it was aimed to aid the propagation of those liberal principles respecting some of the most important concerns of mankind, which is either deserted or virulently opposed by other periodical miscellanies and upon the manly and rational support of which the fame and fate of the age must ultimately depend. It maintained a wide readership. Copies were sent to the United States, and I have found in editing the essays that they were reprinted uh, with or without attribution in other US publications of the age. Her contributions between 1796 and 1802 were often signed using pseudonyms such as Henry Homelove, Humphrey Placid or Solomon Sympathy, and she takes a male voice uh, in uh, these essays. Well, some of the essays are known to be by, uh, uh, by Barbold, and six were included by her, new, her niece Lucy in the posthumously uh, uh, printed works 
and the legacy for young ladies. But many of the essays were not reprinted, uh, and it still remains to be discovered, uh, some that may have been bar by Barbell that haven't been identified. William McCarthy has expanded their number uh, in uh, identifying some of the uh, further works uh, by Barbold, which then he uh, gave me to edit. They range from the playful to the serious, but even in their most playful portraits of fashion, marriage, home improvement, middle-class holidays at the seashore, Barbold offers a critique of consumerism and forges connections between domestic and political realms. Other essays on the election of 1797, the use of opprobrious appellations, education, and the nature of prejudice often sustained meditations on topics of concern to dissenting intellectuals. In my work editing these essays, I've been impressed by how densely elusive they are to literature, philosophy, theories of medicine, and current events. Their form of a letter to the editor, who after all is her brother, creates a sense that they begin with a familiar, a private dialogue between sister and brother. And in fact, two of the essays either respond to an essay that John Aiken wrote uh, or an essay that she wrote that then Aiken responds to. Within this group of essays, Barbold uses wit and homely analogy to offer a more inclusive notion of civil society, even as she is aware of the potential of the writings to be viewed as dangerous or even seditious. Two early essays from 1796 and 1797 uh, I'm going to look at now for the next few minutes, and they employ reference to the domestic realm to argue for political uh, 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 reform. The letter of John Bull adopts the personification of Britain, first introduced by John Arbuthnot in 1712, to argue that the need for reform of British institutions should be collaborative, while also questioning notions of loyalty. The essay appeared in the monthly magazine in April 1796 and was included by Lucy Aiken in the 1825 two-volume edition of Barbold's works. I would argue she doesn't quite get the essay, but that's another matter. Barbold hesitated publishing the essay because of the potentially controversial nature of its content. She added a prefatory note in which she calls the essay a jeu d'esprit, written two or three years earlier, at a time when everybody thought it necessary to prove their loyalty by associations and the most extravagant declarations of attachment to the Constitution. While dismissing the essay as a trifle, the comment about loyalty during a time of war with France registers the threat posed to dissenters by those uh, who were pro-Burke, anti-French, and anti-reform. And one of these associations I think Barbold has in mind is the Association for Preserving Liberty and Property Against Republicans and Levelers. Uh, and of course, we have our own a uh, recent example uh, in our own country of the use of freedom to curtail liberty uh, of others. Uh, there, uh, the activities uh, of this group uh, included uh, the creation of uh, a list of seditious publications, uh, and they had a door-to-door -door appeal to sign oaths of allegiance uh, and some of their own extravagant declarations, as Barbold calls them, uh, took the form of letters from John Bull. Uh, many people signed their petitions out of fear rather than conviction, but neither Anna nor Rochmont Barbold would capitulate. And instead, Barbold replies to writings against Republicans and levelers uh, with a letter of her own in the voice of John Bull. It's understandable that Barbold might defer a publication of a satirical letter uh, with, given the recent memory of crowds who burnt effigies of her friend Joseph Priestley and Thomas Paine. And she would not have forgotten the Birmingham riots of 1791. Uh, there's an image there uh, uh, against support of the French Revolution by dissenters, including Joseph Priestley, which uh, resulted in the burning of his house and his eventual exile uh, to America. 
Barbold follows Arbuthnot in depicting John Bull as a genial, stout, middle-aged yeoman who appeals to common sense. The essay was reprinted in an issue of the Liverpool Mercury in 1831 as a work that could not be introduced more appropriately than at this time when the old Tory system is tottering to its fall, pointing to its relevance during another era in which reform was under debate. John Bull, as a slightly henpecked husband, is employed by Barbell to question what it means to be loyal to British values within the domestic setting of a marriage. Bull mentions one Squire Edmund, a, Edmund, a hectoring, bullying fellow who, they say, is a little cracked, a great favorite with my wife notwithstanding, ever since he has flattered and spoke her fair. For it is not long ago he, that he used to be drawing caricatures of her. This, of course, refers to Edmund Burke and his uh, writings against the French Revolution. I say goes about everywhere telling people uh, that I ought to challenge uh, anyone who presumes to assert to the contrary. Bull tries to keep notions of loyalty represented by Edmund Burke's notions of the beautiful to common sense. His wife, who along with Squire Edmund, constructs loyalty to absurd extremes, is jealous that John Bull is attracted to the new wife Francis acquired and pretends to have found love letters which have passed between us and is sure, she says, I design to part with her false-hearted man as I am. But a uh, bull uh, assures us that if uh, this new wife uh, is a showy, uh, fine-spoken woman, but for all that, I would, would not marry her if I were free tomorrow, for to tell you the truth, I suspect her to be too much of a termagant for me. And besides, John Bull is not given to change. Um, at the same time, his wife is a hoarder who won't throw anything away, and their house is crowded with outdated furniture, representing, of course, outmoded laws and institutions. Bull would like to do a bit of decluttering. As well, Bull has a mother whose demand for finery means children go hungry, and following the tradition of Arbuthnot, Bull's mother represents the Church of England. Bull wants to clean house and revise the domestic economy, which suggests reform, but along with his pro burkean wife, is hampered by his mother. As he intimates with reference to the Civil War, uh, which is equated with more recent writings in support of republicanism, uh, like those of Mary Wollstonecraft and Thomas Paine, if I offer but to dust the books in my study, my mother is afraid. Some of them will should fall upon her head. Indeed, the old lady did get an unlucky blow with one or two of them, which has shaken her not a little. He is called a graceless, atheistical wretch, but a thousand idle report and a thousand idle reports were raised that I'm going to that I'm going to strip and turn my poor mother out of doors. Bull assures that this is not the case, but maintains that his household has too many servants and therefore suggests a need for ecclesiastical and parliamentary reform by cleaning house and economizing. How this should be achieved is telling. I apprehend the first step ought to be for my wife and I to consult together and make a reform in the family management, wherever there may be occasion. For Barbold, true loyalty is one in which the members of the household work together, thus rejecting Burke's paternalistic views for those which are inclusive and leveling. And while this final image of husband and wife consulting together to reform family management looks benign and not terribly earth-shaking, this public statement has potential to be viewed as subversive in its revision of loyalty and who should be included in reform. So, my final example. Similitude of Domestic and National Politics is another playful essay that employs the domestic to contemplate the relation of public and private spheres. It appeared in October 1797 under the signature of CCC, 
at a time when the war against France had become, in the view of many, such a national disaster, with mutinies in the Navy, a huge national debt, that Pitt's government secretly sent uh, peace feelers to Paris. This essay reiterates themes from Barbold's reformist works of the earlier 1790s. Its premise that government begins at home echoes her argument in sins of government, sins of the nation, that individuals bear responsibility for the public transactions of the nation. And her argument uh, in civic sermons that government is the art of managing the affairs of a community, and the first society is the family. Additionally, the essay's insistence that laws be few and easily understood repeats a point made earlier in remarks on public worship. The position she takes is reformist and therefore dangerous to voice in wartime, but Barbold softens her message with a description of good politics within the family. The assertion is made by analogy. Against loyalist doctrines such as that of Hannah Moore's village politics, where the Paynite character Tom is instructed by the Berkey and Jack to study to be quiet, as with lessons for children, Barbold argues that education in the domestic sphere prepares people to be engaged citizens. The essay was reprinted in Philadelphia in Charles Brockton Brown's literary magazine uh, in 1804. The signature would, uh, and uh, in, when it was republished, it, the signature was not CCC, but AB. So that AB signature might seem to indicate that Brown, who reviewed Barbold's edition of Richardson's correspondence and reprinted excerpts uh, from it, as well as some of her other works uh, in his magazine, would have known the identity of CCC. Copies of the monthly were shipped to the United States, including 50 copies uh, to Thomas Dobson, a bookseller in Philadelphia. Uh, and it might be the case, though this is a speculation, uh, that her authorship might have been known uh, to Brown through Joseph Priestley, who resided in Philadelphia uh, between 1794 and until, and until his death in 1804. And during that time, he was in touch with Barbold and with her publisher, Joseph, or their publisher, Joseph Johnson, during those years. Uh, in a more recent study of Brown called Charles Brockton Brown in the Literary Magazine, uh, Michael Cody, the guy who wrote the book, actually, he talks about the essay and mistakenly attributes it as being written by Brown himself. Barbell begins the essay by suggesting a need to bring your private virtues and your private experience into the public stock, because the family is the school for instruction for becoming good citizens and skillful politicians. One can begin to see how her reasoning connects with the lessons and includes the excluded, even in an essay whose imagined audience is male readers, who are those who have the right to govern. A man who aims at being a statesman should begin with domestic politics because he may uh, at, uh, uh, sorry, uh, because he may at home have a great deal of practice upon those important questions which agitate the great world, some of which I shall beg leave to notice. She wonders whether the home space will be a monarchy or a republic. Uh, pretending that no sides are being taken by her. Uh, but if the male is the monarch and the wife is the consort, uh, she suggests, and I think she's thinking of King George and Queen Charlotte, uh, that there likely will be a perpetual struggle for power. What seems most important is the uh, practical, uh, hands-on uh, 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 nature that the home provides as opposed to political theory. If a man will try his skill in resolving this question, he may come forwards into public life with a much better notion of what belongs to the power of the crown than he can get merely by reading newspapers and pamphlets. The essay offers uh, uh, advice gleaned from the domestic that is applicable in the public realm. Controlling rebellious subjects in the form of children and servants will give a would-be statesman understanding to trust his own eyes and ears. As well, uh, rules should be simple and few, 
and punishments fair following the ideas that our subjects are to be considered our equals in all questions of right and justice. A third lesson is the regulation of finances. The only duty is to raise money honestly and fairly and to use it economically and discreetly. And while he is benefiting himself, to remember that he not, ought not to impoverish others. And of course, again, she's thinking of the war economy uh, uh, at the time. Uh, that money should not be borrowed, that can't be repaid. The essay concludes with the observation, I hope I, ha I have, however, said enough to prove that all the virtues of the political may be learned in private life, where only it is much to be regretted, its vices are punished uh, as they uh, deserve. Similitude of domestic and national politics unites the private and the public spheres to suggest, by extension, the inclusion of those who are not included in structures of power. And now my conclusion. In an online talk argued, offered in 2001, uh, once again on Mary Wilsoncraft uh, and Radical Dissent, once again by Barbara Taylor, uh, Barbara Taylor notes that scholars of the late 18th century need to rethink what counts as political philosophy, and that many women writers are what she calls canon busters in the genres of writing they adopted to express political opinions. In fact, my next research project will be to edit book reviews that Wollstonecraft wrote for Joseph Johnson's Analytical Review. So I'm going over to the other side, I guess. Uh, Barbold and Wollstonecraft are too often seen as opposing figures. But I think they should be sharing a pew as cannon busters in their shared quest for human rights. If chronologically and temperamentally they sat in separate pews in Newington Green Church, and there you can see, uh, I think on the right there, uh, in the, what, the fourth row, uh, that glowing little plaque uh, of that's where Barbold sat. Uh, and as far as has been speculated, Mary Wollstonecraft sat sort of near the window on the left in the pews uh, that are going the other way. There's a plaque to Barbold over that black door uh, uh, next to one of the speakers. Anyway, if chronologically and temperamentally they sat in separate pews at Newington Green Church, Wollstonecraft, before she established her career as a writer, uh, and Barbold, after a long career as a writer and educator, they share a passion for extending rights through their writings and place as public intellectuals in a time where women were supposed to stay within the domestic sphere. I think that their perspective should be viewed as being on a continuum rather than an opposition. It is true that Wollstonecraft established a school for girls in Newington Green, just as Barbold and her husband were ending their time running a school uh, for boys at Palgrave. Barbold is notorious for having refused to head a women's college, as she observed in two letters posthumously published as On Female Studies, that while both sexes should acquire general knowledge as rational beings, women's education was, as she says, confined in that a woman is excused from all professional knowledge. I think her use of confined suggests her frustration with what, unlike the more visionary Wollstonecraft, her practical nature meant she couldn't see a way out of. I want to conclude this talk with an image taken uh, circa 1860 of a group of women and girls holding their own in front of Paul, Paul Barbold's Paul Grave School. I think that Barbold would have been happy to see females taking their place, which she could not see realized in her own times. Peter Millard, a scholar of the 18th century, was someone who refused to be confined as an academic with his work for equal rights for LGBTQ two-spirit A plus people in Saskatchewan and with the amendment of the Saskatchewan Human Rights Code. I would like to think that his legacy belongs with those earlier figures he taught and studied, whose advocacy for rights 
still has relevance and who should continue to inspire us uh, to make the world a better place. Thank you. Started. So uh, I was really struck by this uh, this image, this key tension in the work between citizenly ethics typical of dissent. Uh, can you say a little bit about how much that sort of citizenly ethic was was sort of baked into this culture of, of Protestant dissent? Um, that's a big question, and I'm not going to answer it very well. Uh, but um, you know, uh, Barbold is part of a group of people who see. Uh, uh, those who were not Anglican, uh, and so uh, various uh, Protestant uh, sects, Catholics, Jewish people, uh, and slaves and prisoners as being uh, denied basic rights. And her view of people, and I think why, uh, for instance, her poem uh, on the rights of women is seen as, as, as being against women is that she sees people as equal. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not perfect. She has a few problems. Uh, she is as nervous about the poor as uh, other middle class people of her day and, and so forth. Uh, but um, her idea is that people are all rational beings. And if we're all rational beings, we have the right to be educated and uh, 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 the ability uh, to uh, serve as citizens. Now, women don't have the vote. She's well aware of that. They can't act in professional uh, services, but she does see their value as teachers uh, and as mothers uh, for uh, raising kids and being rational beings, as well as being uh, wives with whom husbands can carry on conversations. So uh, I think that begins, I hope, to answer the question. Sure. Uh, so education is, is just so important uh, to her. And, of course, she's thinking, again, uh, as a group of people who can't go to Oxford or Cambridge, therefore can't be, uh, uh, become part of the elite or of the, uh, those who are in charge of things with church and state. So there are these alternative uh, institutions. Warrington uh, eventually turned into Manchester Harris, uh, college at Oxford, uh, where there's a, a stained glass window I've never seen to uh, Warrington. So education is key to everything. And education that doesn't hold people backward. Uh, you know, someone like Hannah Moore, who was a conservative Anglican, uh, she advocated education for the serving classes, but she wanted to, she and others felt people should only be taught to read just enough so they could read the Bible, or just enough so they could be good servants. Uh, but any, as anybody knows, that doesn't work, because the minute you teach uh, someone literacy, uh, they can just go with it and run with it, and uh, the whole world changes. Uh, and that's something, of course, that's so prominent in slave narratives uh, at the time. Uh, and later, for instance, with the narrative of, of Frederick Douglass, whose uh, uh, account of learning to read is, is so moving. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Hi. Good. Mm -hmm. While also instructing them and guiding them. Yeah. Well, you know, again, she's a product of her age, uh, and she does believe that adults have authority. And uh, but of course, she's uh, and the humans 
uh, are superior to animals and, you know, to puss and the dog and so forth. But that doesn't get them off the hook uh, because then it means they have all the more responsibility for taking care of those people uh, or beings uh, and respecting them and respecting uh, their, uh, again, uh, sorry to keep using the same word, their rights, uh, their ability to exist, uh, uh, that uh, sense of common uh, in the mouse poem uh, is one that, again, uh, it's a religious argument because God made these things. They need to be respected and they need to be uh, 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 nurtured and cared for. And if you have the ability as an adult, yeah, she does have a hierarchical relationship with Charles and often tell I mean, at one point she tells him to be quiet or stop, leave her alone because she's busy. Uh, the book begins with her talking about using a pin to follow along uh, the words. Uh, and um, uh, certainly <laughs> this book comes up, uh, Charles, uh, uh, sorry, William Godwin writes to his children when he's away in Ireland and he talks about being in a boat, just like in Mrs. Barbold's book. Uh, Mary Shelley bought or wanted copies of the work for her son. Um, yeah, uh, the relationship is not a 21st century one between a parent, a parental figure, and a child. Uh, but um, it's, uh, again, one that, as, as I tried to show, that is uh, based on respect, even if there's hierarchy. And, it's, and, and that goes back to the political kinds of questions uh, that, uh, and the question that Jerry was asking, that yes, there is hierarchy, but there has to be a hierarchy with respect and responsibility, uh, but not a sense that uh, because I know better, I take care of you and you don't have to think, which is a, a kind of really gross reduction of uh, Edmund Burke's argument uh, for why you know, people don't need the vote. Uh, you know, I know, I'll take care of you, I know, uh, and you don't need to worry about it. Uh, uh, Barbold wa does want uh, people to worry about it because, of course, she sees uh, children are going to be the next generation. So she put her energy, she did teach girls. She didn't refuse to teach girls. Uh, and she has a lot of writings on education for girls and women. Uh, but I think uh, she was... Uh, particularly interested in teaching boys because she knew that that was where the power uh, lay at the moment. Uh, and again, it's not a perfect answer. It's not the answer we want to hear. Uh, but she was going to put her energy into creating new statesmen uh, and people who would further the kinds of things that she believed in, if that begins to, uh, yeah, to answer the question. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I think one of the points of tension is uh, that idea of uh, authorship and authority and because it's a book for kids, it really doesn't matter uh, who wrote it. And you can appropriate it and uh, change it the way you want. So, uh, you know, I, well, it's, it, it does happen if you put on a production of Shakespeare. You may take some stuff out. Or the 18th century made the ending of King Lear a happy one and so forth. Uh, but uh, people uh, barbled, uh, 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 she... Um, revised the work in 1808, and then after that, she left it alone. Uh, she added a few things. Uh, she didn't take out the kitten drowning, uh, if you don't learn to read. Uh, but uh, later editions did. And I uh, had, I'm sure I've told this story to some of you, I was teaching some of the lessons for children uh, in my uh, romantics undergraduate class, and uh, the anthology I was using, which shall remain nameless, uh, had some excerpts from Lessons for Children. And as I was reading it, I thought, that's not by Barbold. Uh, so I contacted Bill uh, and Elizabeth, and Paula, rather, uh, and said, look at this. Uh, this isn't by Barbold. 
And what the publisher had done was they had just taken a book off of Google Books, an edition from the later 18th, 19th century, because it was free, uh, and just pulled something off that looked interesting, except it wasn't written by Barbold. Uh, and so I contacted them, and they said, oh, we're just about to create a new edition, and, you know, uh, we're sending it to the printer in two days, so could you, you know, give us something else? Uh, to put into it. Um, and actually, I was on my way to the MLA to get that award, and I was stuck because of snow in a hotel in Toronto and with really bad Wi-Fi connection. And there I was, cutting and pasting a few passages uh, from uh, uh, Echo uh, that seemed to be uh, better. Uh, so... I mean, the moral there is, is, in some ways, it's back to Kai's question, in a way. Works for kids, you know, they're not, they're not sacrosanct. So you can change them however you see fit uh, for children. And so, you know, I would argue that the message uh, that Barbold is trying to suggest is, is somewhat lost to a Victorian age. It's more interested in the hierarchical relationship between the mother and child and um, some of the stories about, you know, be kind to animals uh, and so forth. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the same thing happens, uh, though I can't prove this, with Lucy Aiken's inclusion of essays like the essay of John Bull. Um, it's a witty essay. It's pretty light, you know. Uh, but I think by 1825, a lot of the references that occur in those monthly review monthly magazine essays are gone. Nobody can remember uh, what was happening then. And one of the things in editing the essays uh, has been tracking down, like, what is she talking about when she refers to something? So uh, God bless Google uh, for uh, searches uh, and, um, you know, uh, context to a certain extent are everything. And, and, and they get a bit lost. On the other hand, I mean, I think some of the essays that I've edited do pay rereading uh, because they're witty or interesting or give a picture of the age uh, and expand the notion of Anna Barbold. She's not the person uh, who only wrote Washing Day uh, and the Mo Mouse's Petition in 1811 or something. Uh, she did a wide variety of, reading, of writing and editing. She's a canon creator with her edition of the British novelist. She edited Richardson's correspondence uh, as well as uh, other writings. Uh, she and her brother created an anthology of songs, of traditional songs uh, in uh, England. Uh, so uh, she's part of, of that as well, of expanding literacy and national literature and, and so forth. So uh, a long-winded answer to your question. Hoping no one else asks another one. She was smart uh, and frustrated. Um, no, yep, absolutely. But her father. Uh, ran, a, ran this uh, school at Warrington. It's where she met Rochemont, who was a student there. And um, she, uh, you know, her mother was a bit opposed to uh, her getting too much education because, of course, her role was to be a wife and mother eventually. Uh, and she made sh uh, sure her father taught her Latin and probably some Greek as well. I think she saw herself as, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an exception uh, to the age. And again, this is not necessarily a defendable uh, position, but perhaps an understandable one, uh, that if you can't do anything with all of that, uh, why bother learning it if it's only going to frustrate you? Uh, though, uh, as a, an intellectual, you know, she used her knowledge to uh, write uh, the kinds of pamphlets I was talking about against the war uh, in favor of, uh, uh, you know, the removal of the test acts and against slavery and so forth. Uh, but I, I think on some level she must have been awfully frustrated as well by her inability. 
uh, to use uh, what she had. And um, again, to compare her with Wollstonecraft, she was much better educated uh, than Wollstonecraft was, for instance, and maybe just all the more frustrated. And it's not to put down Mary Wollstonecraft, because as you're suggesting, the opportunities she had for education were very rare uh, for women, though you know not exclusive. There were other women uh, like her uh, who had access to good libraries, uh, which would be important uh, to be able to read uh, scientific books or access to public lectures on science and uh, other subjects. Yeah, it's 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 a good question. Sure. Right. Um, she knew French uh, because, of course, her husband her husband was French. Uh, so she did go to France and had connections in, Fran in France. And uh, her writings uh, as well were translated into French. Uh, I think the lessons for children were, were widely translated. She did have some connections, as I said, with, with America. She did travel to France, but, I mean, connections... Uh, given the time and the difficulty of, of going places and so forth, uh, meant that, that her prime, and of course, for uh, most of the time, she's living during a period of war uh, when it's very difficult to get any place, uh, let alone send uh, postage uh, to those places. So uh, it's a bit limited. And, and, and to be honest, I, I don't know that much about it, uh, uh, except that she would know other works and books, and certainly through French, she uh, read French, uh, and would have read a, lo a lot of the French philosophers and uh, so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I take your point. It's it's uh, it's it's a good point. It's one that I guess I need to think a little bit more about how that all worked, how those networks uh, worked. But England does present an example, though of course it was France that started it uh, by getting rid of a king, uh, though it didn't work out so well. Uh, but um, uh, the you know. Uh, Again, this is not necessarily my view of history, but uh, one of the great, quote-unquote, miracles of the age is that Britain is just terrified in the 1790s. Uh, and, of course, they have Ireland as an example uh, that uh, the lower orders would rebel and there would be violent revolution, and it didn't happen. Uh, and um, one could argue in peripheral ways that thinkers like Barbold uh, uh, by fighting uh, for rights prevented that from happening. But I think that's probably a very naive view as well. Uh, and I won't go too much further <laughs> with it. Uh, but it's a good question and one, thank you, that I will continue to think about. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Oxfam and, and, and um, the... A uh, humane society is started in this period. Uh, the anti-slavery movements and so forth. Uh, the John Howard Society uh, is is an excellent example. Uh, and sorry, because I'm nervous at the moment. What's the women's version of the John Howard Society? Uh, Elizabeth Fry. Uh, a few years ago, Elizabeth Fry was taken off the five pound note. Uh, uh, because nobody in Britain knew who she was. Uh, and who did, I think they put Churchill and then Jane Austen got on the 10 pound note. And I was just so outraged because even though I couldn't remember her name right now, um, I knew. Because it's, you know, 
<laughs> yes, I took it off and erased my memory. But it's like Canadians know who Elizabeth Fry is. You know, she's she's very important. And in some ways, I I did this whole number in my mind about you know Jane Austen is is often seen as a supporter of Tory values and all of that. And Elizabeth Fry was a Quaker, a nonconformist, uh, and so. You know, given the current climate in Britain, I guess you don't want anybody like that on your five-pound note. Uh, not that I have anything against Jane Austen. I love reading and teaching her, but uh, she, and I don't think she quite is the writer that people think she is. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I saw it as a plot uh, to get rid of Elizabeth Fry. Uh, but it's too bad all those people in Britain don't know who Elizabeth Fry is, because we do. Uh, along with John Howard, because uh, that name is so important uh, in in our own quest for rights for people. Yeah. Okay, I think we're going to have a last question from Doug Thorpe. Yeah. Um, thanks, Lisa. I really enjoyed this. It's great hearing your voice again. Um, I was struck by the, your initial framing of the problem. The black is the music in their experience of the civil disability portrayed by the dissenters, Protestants, not the mm-hmm. Contemporary with the context you set up is, of course, a pretty extensive and at times quite cruel suppression of Catholics in Britain as well. Does Barbell, and I'm sorry, I know nothing about most of the writers you're talking about, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they did. Uh, again, this is something I need to know more. Or, you know, questions always show what you don't know, uh, but they show you what you should know. Uh, yeah, uh, except I don't think that was at the forefront uh, of the of the thought, but it was there. Uh, but I don't think it was uh, at the forefront, though. Certainly, Barbell felt that all religions. Uh, should be tolerated because, uh, you know, she was with a group that really wanted a separation of church and state. And if you separate church and state, then you can go to whatever church uh, you you want. Uh, but, you know, in many respects, Barbold is not perfect. She's a product of her time and, and anti-Catholicism in the age is uh, that and anti-Semitism, I've been, uh, you know, teaching 19, early 19th century fiction lately to my students. who are just horrified uh, by some of the things uh, that are contained in the work that uh, are not so much a conscious attack as they are absolute blindness. And Barbold has a, a, a lot of blindnesses uh, uh, as, as well, uh, which I could go on about, but. Um, maybe I won't. Thank Thanks. That's great. Please uh, join me in thanking Lisa for a great uh, lecture.